Thank you very much. I was really looking forward to that presentation today, um, as I uh, honestly, and uh, it's always good to say that after you talk, Dr. Perry, I have a kind of hate love to this topic, uh, honestly. Uh, why do I hate this topic? Um, I think, uh, and this is an observation most of us will share, I think, that um, there is a, I'd assume a majority out there who is pretty ignoring most of the things you just said and uh, doing pretty well until now, until the hammer uh, came in. Um, and there's really a small but uh, I think growing amount of people or a percentage of, of people and companies and, and organizations really taking care of data protection issues. It actually makes, harder, makes it harder to them to perform, uh, but at the end of the day, as you said, uh, I think it's, it's paid off. What is the love to this topic? The love uh, started, uh, I think, around uh, 2008, where everyone or most of us were pretty much inspired by what this great Obama campaign did in the United States, uh, what they all did with data and, and what they, uh, how they performed, uh, which, is, which was the point where yeah, my interest started in this field. And this is also why I want to start my presentation today with a piece of the recent uh, election campaigns uh, in the United States, States with a mail piece of uh, Senator Ted Cruz, uh, which was in the news. And uh, also to say that, uh, there's one person in the room who knows much more about this topic. May I welcome you, Paula. Uh, Paula is holding a breakout session afterwards, and she's the real expert, so you should be in both panels, Paula. Uh, looking forward to your panel. Uh, if I say something wrong, just uh, don't hesitate to, to correct me, please. Um, I want to start with this mail piece um, that Ted Cruz sent out uh, uh, before the uh, Iowa caucuses. And in a nutshell, what you can see, or maybe you cannot read it here, uh, this was sent uh, to people um, including their percentage score, how likely it's uh, they got a vote on the, at the Iowa caucus. So it's the 55% voter score. <laughs> And what you could also read there is the voter score of your neighbors, which is pretty interesting, right? Uh, and up one, up here, uh, your voter score. And in a nutshell, here's written, hey guy, we know by which probability you're going to vote tomorrow. And uh, we not also know what you're going to do, we'll also tell others what you do. So you might come and vote on Monday. Because after the caucus, we're publishing a new version of the score. So what we have in there is pretty much everything we, we sometimes view with uh, big eyes when it comes to campaigning in the United States. We got those algorithms everyone is talking about and how they calculate the likelihood you're going to vote. Uh, we have behavioral segmentation that uh, refers to yeah, your past and future behavior. And we also have those little nudges uh, Michael Sanders is talking about. Uh, to be precise in here, the nudge of social proof, which means that uh, yeah, you rely your personal behavior on the behavior you observe at other people. And usually, this is scaring Europeans. Who is scared about that? Just so raise your hand. <laughs> Paula, <laughs> I'm shocked. <laughs> um, and usually it's not only scary, it also leads us uh, nearly always to conclude that this is totally impossible here. Because we don't have the stuff, we don't have the knowledge, we don't have the laws, we don't have the resources, we don't have the time, we don't have the money, we don't have the technology. It's impossible here. And as always, and as I started my presentation today, there's always a but. And here's a but too, of course. Because here's the thing, when it comes to Europe, and not only Austria, we observe that in every country we work with campaigning Europe, when it comes to Europe, we think that we don't, that we don't need that anyway. Because of one thing, we get so, such a strong gut feeling. We're so good in estimating things, and we don't need the data, who needs data? We know it by our guts, by our gut feeling. We don't need that. So who thinks of himself, he, has, he or she has a great gut feeling? Raise your hand. 
<laughs> You're scared to raise your hand now, right? Okay, great. So, I'd say before we start talking about data and how we use data in our campaigns of our companies and brands, I'd like to put your gut feeling to test a little bit. Let's take a first test. I'll start with something you just mentioned before in your, uh, in your presentation, not including the approval down there. This is just a simple registry form on a website where you could uh, fill in your name, your postal code, your telephone number. And this website was tested in two variants. In a second variant, they added this little remark here, uh, that privacy standards are very high. Which one of those do you think performed better? It's not the easy one. Who thinks uh, the left one performed better? Raise your hand. One. Who thinks uh, the right one performed better? Raise your hand. Who is insecure? <laughs> Thank you. Uh, yeah. Here's the thing about gut feeling. The left one worked better by 13%. Give you another example. Talking about an energy company in the United States, or to be precise, about a company that tries to save energy, or to, that tries to incentivize uh, US American people to turn down their air condition when they are not at home, which is, uh, my mind is, it's pretty difficult to do that in the United States, convince anyone to switch off the air condition. Um, and they tried it with a really sophisticated, state-of-the-art tool. The latest stuff you've ever seen with a door note. So they went around in the neighborhood and put door notes on the doors. Um, and to summarize the message, it's only in a nutshell, it's not the, it's not the original. To summarize the messages, uh, they tried three different uh, variants. First one told people, okay, turn down your air condition and save money. Second said, and save the planet. Third said, be a good citizen. Which one do you think worked best? Who thinks number one? Raise your hand. Number two? Number three? I'm sorry I fooled you, it was the fourth one. Uh, none of them worked at all. None of them showed any significant impact. Zero. Zero. Nobody was interested in saving money, being a good citizen, nothing at all. So they tried a fourth one that really performed great. Your neighbors do better. <laughs> you remember the social proof from the very beginning? This was the nut in there. So, Here's a third experiment. Again, we have traditional email signups, what we talked about before. Here is get your email updates, it's free. Here is get your email updates, it's free, and join 40,755 <coughs> others to get updates. Which one do you think performed better? Left one, raise your hand. Right one, raise your hand. Don't trust me anything. <laughs> Social proof didn't work here. <laughs> so, um, a hundred, a hundred percent increase. Imagine that. A hundred percent increase just by leaving away uh, the social proof stuff. So why? I don't know why. And you know what? <laughs> Nobody cares why. Here, here. You know what? Testing is just about improving. It's not about asking the why question. It's just about what works better. And we don't know what. Maybe the focus here is more clear. I don't know. You can't, actually you don't have the opportunity to ask people, and if you ask them you don't get the real, you don't get the real feedback. So testing is really about just having a look at what works better and optimizing. And the thing is, and which, uh, which might, may, might sound strange to you, even I will propose a lot of theories here, what's good, what's bad, what works, what not, but the point is, in God we trust, all other spring data. <laughs> and this is what I want to start with uh, in this session. It's not about trusting your gut feelings when we're talking about database campaigning. It's really about trusting data and letting, da letting data uh, give you the right direction. And what we want to focus on now in this session is talking about three major fields where <coughs> data can really do something good for your campaign operation or for your company or whatever. I think, and I'm absolutely convinced, they can save or earn you money, which is pretty good argument. They can boost your engagement rates and they can gain valuable insights uh, to you. And 
I want to go deeper into uh, each and every one of them. Let's take the first one, save money. I have a pretty uh, old example, meanwhile, 2012, this long ago, it was a year when the campaigning summit started. Uh, here's a mail piece of the Obama campaign in 2012. It was an email sent to the whole email list, which was about 16 million people then. And um, they had this subject line, you, maybe can, you, you can read up there, which was, I will be outspent. So as uh, Katie Harper just said uh, on the main stage, it's really a lot is about money and how much money you raise in the United States uh, campaign efforts. So how much money an email can raise is a really crucial question. So they sent out this email and raised with one single email nearly $2.7 million, which is a very great amount. Who thinks this headline was based on gut feeling? Raise your hand. Nobody anymore. How many variants do you think they tested? Who thinks uh, two? Who thinks more than five? More than 10? More than 20? You have a good gut feeling. <laughs> so it was really 12. 12 uh, different examples of emails they tested. And a second question to you. What do you think? What's the optimization potential by doing such a testing process? And here it's pretty clear, and this is why I take this example. Here it's pretty clear because we're talking about true dollars. We're talking about money. Usually we talk about volunteers or people signing up, but this is all you know, soft currency. This is hard dollars. So what do you think? How huge is the optimization potential between the worst email they tried out and this one, which obviously seems to be the best one, um, who think, so they gained 2.7 million, who thinks uh, the optimization potential was 10% uh, or higher? 20? Raise your hand. 30? No. Later. 40%? 50%? 60? 70? Who thinks more than 100%? Here's the thing. Um, they tried out this 12 different variants. And the one which worked least just raised a calculated and estimated amount of $403,000. And the best working was estimated with 2.5 and actually has been 2.7. So also a really precise estimation. So what you see here is that here we actually have a factor of, a factor of six in between. Yeah? So this is the potential when we talk about testing and a testing culture, establishing a testing culture, and with it, optimizing your campaign operation based on data. This is basically comes down to the principle of A-B testing. And what is A-B testing? A-B testing could be if we, and I think this group will be too small to do a, a real A-B test for optimization. What we've got to do is we say, in here are 50 people. And 50 could also be 50 million or 50,000. I pick 12 of you and ask you, which one do you like, which one do you like? And take, then take, those are the white people here, and then take the best version and send it out to the rest. So you do a kind of pre-testing and send the best version. And best version, we're not talking only about emails. We're talking about websites. We're talking about emails. We're talking about ads. We're talking about even postal mail. We did an email, a, we did an A-B testing with a postal mail. So it's possible in every, in every field. You can test everything. Styles, messages, everything. Give you another example from a campaign of ours, uh, which I tried to hide uh, here, which one it was. Uh, but just to understand, we used the testing principles to really test out which political message works out best. And usually the approach of testing our political messages is, I don't know, usually, I know I work in political campaigns, usually it's, uh, don't ask anyone, I know it, yeah? Um, and if, if this is not, usually it's kind of uh, doing a focus group or something like that. What we have done is just take 400 euros, <laughs> so a small amount of money, and putting the four messages to test on Facebook. So really setting up the target audience, 
we wanted to attract with our political message also offline. So really setting up the demographics, setting up the segmentation, and really spreading those four different messages. And what we saw that with 100 euros for each message, uh, we gained an average reach between 14,000 or 15, sorry, uh, 13,000 and nearly 30,000 people. But, and here comes the but again, uh, it's not only the reach, we also look about how much people are interacting because an interaction is a much more valid indicator of really what works best. It's not only the reach, an interaction means that you really got someone. And we finally uh, collected, tried to collect signups. This means conversions. So we wanted to really people commit on a certain issue in terms of one of the different wordings. And what you see here is there's a factor of 12 in an optimization. So at the end of the day, if you spend, I don't know, 10,000 euros, 50,000, or 100,000 euros, wherever, it might be the case that you, just because you ignore the principles of testing, you get out only a twelfth of your potential, of your media budget. So testing, and this is what I wanted to show to you, can really save you money, or in the case of Obama, earn you money. Let's come to the second point. Uh, when we read or talk about segmentation and, and using uh, databases, database campaigning uh, in terms of segmentation, we're usually talking about a very precise form of demographic segmentation. And I want to do one more experiment with you together. Uh, questionnaire. <laughs> Who could that be? He is born in 1948. He was raised in England. He's married in his second marriage. His two kids, he's successful, he's very wealthy. He's well known internationally. He knows Queen Elizabeth quite closely. And he likes dogs and spends his winter holidays in the mountains. Who could that be? Prince Charles? Who thinks Prince Charles? That's great. It's Prince Charles. But here's the problem. It's not only Prince Charles, it's also Mary Lou Madison. <laughs> so, this is the thing about demographic segmentation. Pardon? Ah, also Mary Lou Sorry for that. <laughs> it's not true for Merlin Manson, unfortunately. Yeah? Ozzy Osbourne, my friend. Uh, sorry. Um, thanks for correcting. Um, nevertheless, what we see here is that it's not always the best way to segment your audience. You can look at two very different kinds of people. If you want to really boost your engagement, you have to rely on the behavior of people, which is a very different uh, kind of segmentation, which is, here in a nutshell, that you identify people who might be a potential for your campaign or who might be important for your campaign, try to interact with them in any way, let them sign up for something, let them commit on something, ask them something, I don't know, let them write uh, a letter to the editor or taking part in an event or whatever. And here's the important thing, and then tracking this behavior. And here's the point what we talked about before. Uh, of course, here in Europe it's about asking if you're allowed uh, to track this behavior, but that's the framework we have to deal with. And afterwards, when you track this behavior, you really have to change chance to uh, mobilize and engage someone more specifically. And I want to give you uh, two or three short examples why this matters, why this really matters knowing what someone has done before and using this information uh, to yeah, develop what someone should do afterwards. I'll give you a, an example from a uh, social scientist uh, from the United States, Anthony Greenwald. He did a study before a US election <coughs> campaign. He, was, he did an, a split test. The difference is a split test is just splitting you into half and asking you a uh, question and, and performing something different with you and then seeing how you perform differently. He asked um, one focus group, a large focus group, thousands of people, the day before election day, are you going to go to vote tomorrow? How many do you think said yes? 100%. Good US citizens. Everyone said, I'm going to vote. The second focus group was not asked if they're going to vote. 
And it turned out that the group that was asked and committed on going to vote the next day showed a significantly higher voter turnout than the other one by 25 percentage points, which is really significant. So tracking a commitment of someone on a certain issue can be really crucial, can be a really crucial part of your campaign effort when it comes to mobilizing people on, uh, based on this commitment. Give you a second example. This is also true for table reservations in restaurants. There's a traditional no-show rate in restaurants. People reserve a table, as they do here, tickets uh, at the campaigning summit. Um, and usually uh, you call the restaurant and say, okay, you're going to have a table with two persons. Uh, and they say, okay, thank you, see you tomorrow. Which uh, results in a approximately 30% no-show rate on average. That's an example from the United States. And then they did an experiment. They changed the dialogue on the phone slightly. People were not only, did not only uh, put in their reservation, they were asked, can you call us please when your plans are changing? And the man or lady on the telephone waited to receive a yes from the guy reserving the table. And it, showed, it turned out that uh, the no-show rate decreased from 30 to 10% just because people gave a commitment. So again here, Knowing the past behavior of someone can influence future behavior. Uh, third experiment, which really should demonstrate that the payoff is, is really high to do that. This is an experiment from uh, a, a committee for uh, uh, <coughs> traffic security, it is, uh, in the United States. They had a campaign, a drive safe campaign, um, and uh, they went from door to door and asked people if they were willing to to put up a sign, a yard sign, into their yard. So a really small sign with a 180 centimeters uh, times 90 centimeters, so really decent. Um, and at least 17% agreed to put this sign with, you know, take care in our streets uh, and, 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 and uh, drive slowly. Uh, at least 17% uh, agreed to put this sign in their yard. In the second focus group, they tried a different approach. They sent uh, someone, a research assistant, to the doors, asking people if they were willing to put just a small sign, so traffic security is important, tiny little sign, into their yard, where nearly everyone agreed. And two weeks afterwards, they asked them again to put the larger sign into their, into their yard, and then 76% agreed. What does that mean? The fact that they really tracked the previous behavior of people who agreed to put a small sign into their yard and that they relied on this fact when asking them a second time improved their results. Let's uh, put that again into the campaign world. We did an experiment uh, with a party uh, here in Austria um, where we sent out an email and asked, asked them to commit on a certain issue. Uh, we sent out an email and asked them, okay, are you going to support this issue or no, I don't care. Um, and out of the mail list, which was about, I, I think, 50,000 people, at the end of the day, uh, nearly 5,000 people uh, supported or yeah, gave us a commitment on the issue. And in the second step, we took this 5,000 people and asked them to go deeper, to contribute deeper, to do something meaningful like writing a, a letter to the editor, for example. And we put them to test to a second group, which was, uh, uh, which was of, the, of the same amount, and we looked how people behave differently. So would someone who already gave a commitment on an issue really do more? And what we observed is, out of this 5,600 that took a previous action, 500 went deeper and contributed more, whereas from the other group, only 134 went deeper. So again, a 260% uh, increase in optimization just by really relying on people's behavior and their data. Final point is, uh, no, I'm slightly over time, yeah. Um, final point is, data can really, of course, help to gain you valuable insights. Um, I'm talking about different uh, type of insights here. For example, you can really observe 
people's attention. Also in the web, take for example this example here. We have a website where we uh, put a heat map on. Uh, it's not our example where a heat map was put on uh, just to measure uh, which different pictures worked out best for this website. And they find out, found out that it's uh, not that great to let uh, babies always work great, of course. Yeah, uh, it's not that great that when the baby looks you into the, into your eyes, but it's better when the baby looks uh, at the text. So. They really measured with a heat map, and I can just recommend you uh, to test yourself how you behave when you're on your desktop, laptop, and the point is you're uh, going with your mouse wherever your attention is, which is uh, pretty, pretty crazy when you observe yourself. Uh, and they took this example to really optimize their performance. We had another interesting example from a campaign of ours, where we put a heat map on a campaign website, and the heat map showed that despite the fact that uh, the initiator of the campaign was mentioned on the right top of the page, but despite this fact, the first thing people do when they go to this campaign website, they scroll down, 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 and read the imprint. Who's that? Really? Is it really true? Um, and what we did then is we thought, okay, there's two things. One thing is we could put a warning on the right top with yellow blinking style, hey, this campaign is from blah, blah, blah. But we thought that was not the point. What we did on the opposite was, uh, yeah, to my mind, much more interesting. We used the fact that they went directly to the imprint and just put a sign up and support opportunity in the imprint and let people sign up there. So we thought, when it's the people that obviously have the desire to go straight ahead down, look at the imprint, when it's necessary to catch them there, we go there and offer them something meaningful to do at this place. And it really led to a two-digit uh, increase in signups. A final example is, uh, is one of a campaign we did for, for Austrian uh, Airlines uh, this year, where it was a campaign about all about uh, our national identity, what we really relate, which values we relate to our identity and stuff like that. And I wanted to give you this example because we talked about a lot uh, about getting approval for people sharing their data. And that of course you have to ask them, of course you have to get permission, which we all did here, of course. But why I show you this example is because we always think data collection and data harvest and data earning is this thing about where people have to type in huge amounts of data and then we're asking why should anyone do that and stuff like that. And I just want to give you that example because sometimes it can't be that easy. It can just be putting some stickers into your supporter password, which is also a kind of sharing your data with a campaign. So it's not always <coughs> the sign-up form where you have to fill out and uh, your shoe size or stuff like that. Sometimes it's just taking yeah, some stickers into your passport and with it sharing the things you care about, sharing the values uh, that define you. So this is really a different approach uh, which uh, stores and saves individual uh, behavioral data to optimize your campaign operation. As I'm Meanwhile, not only slightly over time, but uh, really over time, uh, I want to sum up and uh, say that data can provide a lot to your campaign operation. It can do three things. It saves you money or can earn you money. It can boost your engagement and it can gain insights. And never forget the most important thing, you don't trust all of the spring data. Thank you very much.